Let me uh, start the recording on my side. All right, thanks. I want to see a few more directors come on here. And Shebra, I know it was tough. Thankfully, all was, all went, everyone's safe. Everyone's yeah. safe. And thanks to all the law enforcement partnership. Yeah. Pretty incredible. Yeah, great. And the hospitals that were quickly oh, responding. Yeah. I learned of it from a text from my niece in uh, at at Packard Hospital at Stanford that was beginning to move people. Wow! They already had a life flight apparently in the air, but didn't turn around. Let's see, I'm seeing a good group of folks here. <laughs> Okay, we'll give folks just a little bit more time and then we'll get started. There's Rebecca. Hey, Larry. There's Mike. Yeah, very good. All right. Well, should we get this going? I'd like to call this meeting to order. This is the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District Board of Directors meeting for October of 2022. And we have a roll call, please, Donna. Yes, uh, Director Brown. Present. Director Downing. Present. Director Dutra. Here. Director Colantary Johnson. Present. Director Koenig. Here. Director Lynn. Here. Director McPherson. Here. Director Myers. Don't see her. Okay. Uh, Director Pegler. Here. Director Parker. Here. Director Rockin. Here. Ex officio Director Henderson. Here. And ex officio Director Northcutt. And I see that she's just coming just on. Coming <laughs> coming sure. on. There she is. <laughs> thank you. And we do have quorum. Great. Thank you. All right. Under announcements, I'll note that today's meeting is being broadcast by Community Television of Santa Cruz County. Thank you for your work on this. And uh, any comments from our board of directors before we dive in? All right, let's dive. Oral and written communications to the board. I know we have uh, two that were included in the packet. Donna, did we receive anything else beyond that? We have not received anything else. All right. Um, looking to our public members, any uh, comment from the public today on items not on the agenda? I'm looking to my list of attendees for any hands that might be raised. I'll give it just a moment. I'm not seeing anything. I'm not seeing any. All right. Uh, any communications from labor organizations? Uh, Brandon, I see your hand. Good morning. Would you like to speak? Good morning, members. Good morning. <clears throat> I just want to take a moment this morning to talk about some one of the upcoming changes to our schedule. As we continue to push through our driver shortage, we have on average 20 drivers now hitting their maximum limits, working 70 plus hours a week to provide service. These conditions are becoming unsustainable. We have been working hard internally to come up with creative solutions to minimize impacts to service while providing a bit of relief to our drivers. Part of that solution is a reevaluation of our Highway 17 schedule. Since COVID, we've only brought back roughly half of our 17 service, even though our ridership has doubled in the past year. Ideally, we would be able to restore some of these trips, but we just haven't recovered our numbers enough to make that feasible. Instead, we looked at how these trips are scheduled and realized that we have a massive time sink getting into our frequency by sending these routes past Yardon Station. 
These routes can be found consistently playing leap leapfrog with the VTA buses that run the exact routing that we do out of Deardon. For the coming bid, we're looking to eliminate that redundant routing past Deardon Station, and as a result, can add frequency to the Highway 17 trips. Working with VTA schedules and practice, this means that some passengers may need to transfer to a VTA bus to complete their trip. However, the majority of our riders are using the service between Deardon and Santa Cruz Metro. VTA frequency ensures that a transfer should be kept, should keep wait times to a minimum, and no one should be waiting longer than five minutes for a transfer. We do have programs in place that VTA will accept our period passes, and we also provide light rail transfers from our bus. By making these changes and reducing these runtime service hours, we can start to add back some of the Mason frequency on the Highway 17. So I just wanted to touch on that briefly, and I know that uh, Mr. Ergo probably has more to follow up with on that for you. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, any other labor speakers? Okay. Seeing none, uh, let's check with the Metro Advisory Committee. Um, exactly. John Ergo is trying to speak. Oh, thank you, John. I'm sorry. I, it hadn't come back up on my screen. Please respond, John, if you'd like. Yeah, Chair, if it makes sense now, I just wanted to touch briefly on a few sure. changes that we've been working with SMART uh, to relieve pressure on operators. Should I do that now? I think that's fine. Okay, great. We don't uh, normally go into detail on the service changes each bit, but there's one other change that's uh, potentially significant this winter uh, along the lines of restructuring uh, for routes to provide more uh, frequent service and to relieve the pressure on operations. Uh, we're looking to uh, restructure the 69A, 69W, and 91X, uh, three routes that travel once an hour between Watsonville and Santa Cruz, into a single route this winter bid um, that would serve Main Street, uh, Watsonville Hospital, and Cabrillo College, and then continue on to the normal 69 uh, routing to downtown Santa Cruz. So this the end result of this means that if you're a commuter from Watsonville to Cabrillo College, there really is no change uh, in the frequency of service you have or the travel time. Um, and there's actually going to be additional service uh, throughout the day serving Cabrillo College because the 69s run at a significantly longer span than the 91X does. Um, so I just wanted to, to bring that change up now. We'll, you know, this will be implemented in December. And, uh, you know, we'll make sure we're, we're out ahead of uh, providing customer information on our website and through our channels so that people are aware of this change. Um, uh, but this this will help uh, by restructuring the 91X into the 69, it'll help relieve some of the operator pressure that we're facing um, while still maintaining the service that we want to provide to Cabrillo and to Watsonville. Great. I see a question from Mike Rockin. Chase, so just a quick comment. I, I want to appreciate uh, working with an agency where the uh, employees, the bus drivers who actually run the routes are involved in the planning. I appreciate John Ergo and the, our staff's response and working with them. Uh, we shouldn't take that for granted. There's lots of places, including my employer, the University of California, where you know employees are not who, who are doing the work don't necessarily get consulted about things like schedules or how the place runs. And so it, it's really... Uh, I think a positive feature of the way our agency is running and I want to appreciate both the employees and our management for the way that uh, relationship works. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Alta, I see your hand. Yeah. Thank you, um, John, for that email and the <coughs> warning just uh, part of process. We're out December 17th, I think, and we're not back until the end of January. So um, some of that load should be lightened just with us being out of session. Um, so thank you for the heads up, and I will make sure that we uh, mention that in our meetings. Thanks, and I appreciate so, all of the so efforts that everyone is making to help serve um, the, the increased ridership from Cabrillo. Thank you. Thanks, Alton. Just to briefly touch on that, so the winter bid, uh, because of this change, will as we work through it, will extend two weeks. So we'll actually cover your whole, uh, the end of your semester with the existing service. There won't be any disruption right. until the following year. Yeah. Right, thank you. Very good. Next, I see Director Dutra. 
Thank you. Thanks, John. And I, I think to all the bus drivers as well. I know this has been quite difficult, um, you know, not having enough staff to cover all the routes that we have and um, all the service. I just want to kind of maybe, <clears throat> excuse me, have a little bit of clar a clarifying um a clarifying question. So that so basically, it's going to run every hour through the sixty nine, um, and then the ninety one X would be just you know put on hold for a while. Um, is that what I, is that what I'm hearing? And also, how has the ridership been on the sixty nine? Um, is it been low? And so this kind of makes sense that we're doing it this way. Yeah. So the the sixty nine A will essentially essentially replace the ninety one X in the winter bid. Uh, running at the same frequency uh, every hour. The combined change between 69A, W, and 71 means there's four de four departures per hour serving Watsonville, Cabrillo to downtown. So it's a it's a slight improvement uh, on the frequency and also because the span is longer. Um, the 69A ridership is about 70% of pre-COVID levels. Um, it's it's been increasing uh you know throughout this time but there's there's definitely room on the route for mm -hmm. riders the 91x ridership uh, is less than that's about 50 percent of pre-covid and part of that is is due to the cabrillo ridership hasn't quite recovered uh, mm. actually is is below 50 percent compared to pre-covid levels well, I think as like Alta said uh, that, you know, we're going into, um, they're going to go into winter break. So that, that'll lessen it as well. Um, the impact, when do you guys, I mean, is this like until we find people to hire or what, how do you, where do you see, when do you see this changing? It's back in spring. Is there, is there, a, are you thinking about a date that you guys are aiming for? I don't have a date in mind. It is dependent on operator hiring. So we're in constant recruitment and training mode. Um, you know, Brandon maybe can touch on it, but I think we've got, uh, or it might be touched on later in, in Michael's report, but we're training a current class. I think we have 15 offers in the, in the works for the next class, and it's just a constant cycle. Um, any, any change that lasts for greater than 12 months, we would do a, a, what's called a Title VI analysis per Federal Transit Administration. So, you know, we'll, that would trigger a larger public process. If it's less than that, then we may add it back. If it goes beyond 12 months, then we'll come back to this board uh, with the Title VI process for any any change that lasts beyond 12 months. Okay, great, thank you. Next, I see Director Parker. Thank you. Uh, hey, I wanna um, uh, just reiterate what Michael uh, said a few minutes ago about having your drivers and your um, supervisors uh, working together to solve a problem uh, because uh, I was heartened to hear that anything from Watsonville to Cabrillo was pretty much the same. The frequency would be regular, that you took pains to make sure that Crestview um, uh, through Watsonville High was going to be um, uh, continued so they wouldn't have disruption at that point. Uh, and I totally get the that you're maxing out on your driver operators and their time for even any overtime, as my understanding is correct. Like, I mean, you can make the call and say who could drive this, and then the 91X would, if they don't have a driver, they don't have a driver, the route doesn't run. So it's getting to that critical point. And um, I really appreciate um, the solutions that are happening way before uh, that happens. Uh, way before that critical time happens. And I um, I look forward to talking to you, John, a little bit more uh, about uh, the specifics, but um, I just want to compliment everybody uh, in the problem-solving process that it's uh, good for everybody. And hopefully, uh, I, I know I've been out there beating the bushes uh, and saying, hey, come on, this is a great, this is a great place to work and it's a great career to start. And, uh, and I know that we have great hopes for... Um, continued uh, people in our classes. Uh, but uh, what happens if we have 15 that we're giving offers to and uh, do we usually get 15 out of 15? Uh, or is that usually 50% of the folks uh, take the offers? How does that work, John? Historically, it's been about 50% for the last couple of, of cycles, but we'll, we'll see. Uh, we may get more this time. Okay. 
Well, great. I just want to compliment everybody involved in uh, making this happen so that the ridership, I, I hear from Cabrillo past, it's going to be a little bit, maybe a 10 minute difference in time frame. Um, but that's yeah. minimal compared to the bigger picture. And I really appreciate uh, the solutions that you guys came up with. So thank you very much from South County. Appreciate it. Thank you for those comments, Dr. Parker. So we're bringing it to you now. We just want to get ahead of any um, concern that the public will have about this. When, when they hear 91X is being suspended, that's going to raise some alarms. But through working with SMART, <clears throat> we've developed a solution where there really is no change, as you mentioned, between the service between Watsonville and Cabrillo. There is that 10, 10 to 20 minute extra travel time to, towards downtown Santa Cruz for and then Watsonville to Santa Cruz. And we'll look to restore that service when we have the operators to do so. Very good. Thank you, Ari. Thank you, John. Uh, next, we're back to uh, the Metro Advisory Committee. Did we receive anything from them this month, Donna? And there, there is no written communication. All right. Uh, and in terms of additional documentation, I know you sent out a revised item 9.5. That should have. That's been. correct. All right. Yeah. So folks so, should have that in their email and in front of them now, I hope. All right. That brings us to the consent agenda. Quite a few things in there this month. Um, any items that the directors wish to have pulled to discuss? Anyone in the public have questions or requests to pull an item from the consent agenda for discussion? I'm not seeing any. I'll give it a moment. Entertain a motion to approve approval of the consent agenda. Thank you. I hear a motion from Rodkin. Second. That was uh, Koenig. Koenig. Thank you. And I'll, if I may just add, I'm really excited to see uh, the support of 9.5 to submit a grant um, for significant improvements along the SoCal Drive corridor um, for bus rapid transit. Um, it'll be a highly visible project if we can pull it off and is a, a really absolutely the best place for uh, efficient transit in our community and um, we'll definitely be looking at adding housing along that corridor as well to support more ridership in the future. You're here. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Donna Lind. Well, <laughs> Manu reminded me that I wanted to uh, share. I had attended a meeting with the um, governor's uh, uh, mm, affairs uh, I'm forgetting the term, but anyway, a group from the governor's office, and they were talking about infrastructure funding, the uh, once in a generation type funding. And I was able to share um, the RTC project that, uh, you know, that this is a project ready to go and moving forward. And that would be something that would provide or serve a great area, which is one of the things they were looking for. So I was able to share that information. I think they had visited, um, uh, Metro that morning before a meeting, so uh, and, and uh, mentioned that to Michael Tree. So just hopefully, you know, you know, hopefully being able to share a few of our needs and um, at that forum will be helpful. So. Thank you, Donna. Very good, good point. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve the agenda consent agenda. We have a roll call, please. Director Brown. Aye. Director Downing. Aye. Director Dutra. Aye. Director Colin Perry Johnson. Aye. Director Koenig. Aye. Director Lind. Aye. Director McPherson. Aye. Uh, and Director Myers. You're muted, Donna. Oh, you're muted. I think we saw your I mouth can... move in the affirmative. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Aye. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Director Pegler. Aye. Director Parker. Oh, yes. you're muted. Okay. Yeah. There yes. And Director Rockin. Aye. And the motion passes. Very good. Thank you for that. We're on to the regular agenda. And the first item is a longevity award presentation for Holly Alcorn who has been with us for 10 years. Um, I think, do we, we have an action on that, don't we? 
Um, I don't have anything to read. But, uh, no. No, there's no, there's no, yeah. just not an, thank you, Mike. Just an announcement. Yes, very good. All right. So we have, we have her uh, item of uh, our accounting specialist, 10 years of service. It's been a long 10 years. A lot has happened during this last 10. Next item is retiree resolution of appreciation for Bonita Kramer. And I think Donna, you had a, did you have a picture up that we can, we know who she is by thing. There we go. All right. And here we do have a, a resolution, an action from the board. I'll move uh, approval of that resolution. That's we your second. Second. Very Is good. Director Koenig. Oh, McPherson. Either one, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the motion was rock and the second was was McPherson. McPherson. Very good. All right. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Director Brown? Aye. Director Downing? Aye. Director Dutra? Aye. Director Colin Perry Johnson? Aye. Director Koenig? Aye. Director Lynn? Aye. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Myers? Aye. Director Pegler? Aye. Director Parker? Aye. And Director Ruffin. Aye. And the motion passes. Very good. And thank you for your many years of service and congratulations on your retirement. Okay, item 12, request for authorization and funding of a safety and training coordinator. And I'm turning this over to Margo, I believe. Good morning, everyone. Um, We're requesting for a safety and training coordinator, um, kind of in the line of moving along our classes, our bottleneck to make sure that we have enough operators for the future. Um, the position will not only help with that, but our VTT accident training, um, just an overall support. It'll give us a third person to uh, work through our proposal of four classes, uh, you know, for the upcoming year. Um, and um, also to assist with our other increased training needs our new vehicles, the Proterra electric vehicles and, and the new Gillix. Um, so we are uh, asking that you approve and, uh, and fund this position. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions from our directors? Sounds great. Uh, entertain a motion. Um, Approval, second. I think that was McPherson and Rothkin. I think this is a very good idea, and I, I appreciate trying to keep the classes moving as fast as we can to get folks through. So let's have a vote, please. Director Brown? Aye. Director Downey? Aye. Director Dutra? Aye. Director Colin Terry Johnson? Aye. Director Koenig? Aye. Director Lynn? Aye. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Myers? Aye. Director Pegler? Aye. Director Parker? Aye. And Director Rockin? Aye. And the motion passes. Thank you. Very good. All right. We're on to items 13 and 14. Wandamu, are you going to be introducing our colleagues from uh, the state and federal here? You're muted, Wandamu. Yes. There we go. Yeah, good morning, board members, staff. Uh, my name is Wendumu Mangisto, Metro's Capital Planning and Grants Program Manager. I'm here to introduce uh, Michael Pimentel, uh, Metro's Legislative Advocate at Shao Yoder, Antwick, and Schmizer, and Lang uh, Advocacy Team. Uh, today, Michael will uh, provide a state legislative update to us. Uh, uh, thank you, Michael. Well, thank you so much, Wanda Moo and uh, Mr. Chair and board members. Pleased to be with you this morning. As Wanda Moo noted, I am Michael Pimentel, legislative advocate with Shaw Yuri, Antwi Schmelzer, and Lang. And I'll be presenting to you solo this morning and without my usual co pilot, Josh Shaw. Josh does send his regards and his apologies. He cannot be here today. Unfortunately, since we scheduled 
uh, our time to present to you this morning. He had to schedule a medical uh, procedure, which unfortunately conflicted uh, with this meeting. And so with that, I do want to begin my presentation with a recap of the 2021-2022 regular legislative session. That two-year session ended in the evening of August 31st, and that date kicked off a month-long bill signing period for Governor Newsom that ran through September 30th. Now, in that period, Governor Newsom evaluated and signed several hundreds of bills, including one, SB 957, that directly impacted Santa Cruz Metro and its workforce. But during today's presentation, I will focus on several of the most significant bills impacting public transportation generally and that align well with the priorities or the interests of Metro. And of course, as I conclude my presentation, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, from the board uh, to further inform uh, this uh, update. And so I'll begin with SB 922 by Senator Scott Weiner from San Francisco. This is a bill that would expand and extend a variety of CEQA exemptions for clean transportation and transit projects, including those that are noted for you on your screen. I think what is of critical importance is as Metro continues to advance its program on zero emission bus deployment, uh, this bill would extend through 2030 the CEQA exemptions for building out zero emission charging and refueling infrastructure and notably related facilities. This is a new get for this year. It means that Metro would be able to, in the event that it's building new operational and maintenance facilities to support the transition to zero emission technologies, also see those exempted from CEQA. Uh, that was signed into law by Governor Newsom. Additionally, uh, knowing that uh, a point of interest for uh, this board has been uh, continued progress on reducing fares or uh, making uh, fares free for uh, various uh, uh, key populations. I'll note that SB 942 by Senator Newman of Orange County uh, would authorize transit agencies to utilize their low carbon transit operations program dollars. These are monies that flow to Metro on a formula basis from the state of California. Uh, can now be used to subsidize and uh, support on an ongoing basis uh, fare free or reduced fare programs that was signed into law by Governor Newsom on September 30th. Uh, but as I mentioned, this bill that relates to fare free transit, I will note that there was a larger, more expansive bill that was also before Governor Newsom. This was AB 1919 by Assemblymember Holden from Pasadena. This bill would have created a youth transit pass pilot program that would have been funded by a new state uh, budget support to fund uh, fare free transit passes provided to students. Under the structure of the bill, it would have been purely a permissive program that transit agencies could subscribe to in partnership with educational institutions that was broadly defined, UC, CSU, California Community College System, and also school districts. Because the budget support to bring this bill online was ultimately not included in the final state budget, the bill was vetoed by Governor Newsom, who noted that the bill would create some undue cost pressures on uh, the state budget at a time when we are facing a potential deficit in this next fiscal year. Now, I do want to touch on also a few other bills uh, that relate to public transit, but from a slightly different bet. And those would be two bills that relate to the nexus between public transit and housing. The first bill that I'll be presenting on is AB uh, 2011 from Assembly Member Wick from Berkeley. This bill creates streamlined approval processes for affordable housing and mixed uh, income housing projects along uh, commercial corridors. And the way that this bill has defined uh, this form of ministerial review uh, and that expedited review would be to tie uh, that type of streamlined approval uh, to the project's proximity to what is known in, in California state law as a major transit stop. Uh, and that speaks more particularly to existing rail stations, ferry stations, uh, bus stations, but also to uh, corridors for which you have bus routes that have a service intervals of 15 minutes or less. This bill also, also signed by Governor Newsom. I also then want to cover AB 2097 by Assemblymember Friedman from Burbank. 
This bill would prohibit a public agency uh, from imposing parking minimums on residential, commercial, or other developments if the project is located within one half mile of public transit. Uh, and the idea here is that we can help encourage more transit riders uh, by not making parking and car ownership the default mode of travel for uh, everyday Californians. This bill also signed into law by Governor Newsom. Uh, and then finally, I do want to highlight one uh, other bill uh, related to that transition to zero emission uh, technology is AB 2622. It expands on current law that currently provides a sales and use tax exemption for the purchase of zero emission buses by extending the life of that uh, sales tax exemption through 2026. This is expected to save transit agencies between 30 and $50,000 for every zero emission bus purchase. And it is meant to serve as a complement to other forms of state support that ultimately reduce the incremental cost of transition to these technologies, hopefully making those vehicles more economic for the agencies and therefore more natural choice uh, to move into as you are considering fleet replacement. This bill also signed into law uh, by Governor Newsom. So as I move on, there are a few other uh, items that I want to touch on that, that depart from uh, the legislative, um, at least with regards to this last session. And the first is a look ahead to the 2023-2024 legislative session. Here I want to note the legislature will be convening for the first year of the 2023-2024 session on December 5th. At that time, it will largely be an organizing meeting uh, where discussions around uh, leadership for the Assembly for the Senate will take place. And I will note for you that there will be some significant changes in the legislature in this next two-year term. And that's because fully 100 out of the 120 seats in the state legislature are going to be seeing a form of election or re-election. Note for you on your screen that 20 seats are up in the Senate. All 80 seats are up in the Assembly. And then as you'll see on your screen, there is a balance between both houses where we have seats that are fully open because of retirements or term limits. And then we have a balance of incumbents seeking re-election. Notable for Metro would be Senator Laird will remain in the legislature. His term is not yet um, is not yet uh, ending. And Assembly Member Stone ultimately chose not to seek re-election, which means uh, that Metro will have a new representative in the California State Assembly. Uh, now, finally, as we look ahead uh, to 23-24 uh, legislative session, we'll highlight for you uh, that already. Uh, Josh and I are in conversations with CEO Tree about Metro's priorities for uh, the calendar year 2023. And we'll be meeting over uh, this fall and into winter to define a clear set of uh, programmatic and legislative priorities and objectives for Metro that we can pursue on your behalf in that calendar year 2023 and with an eye toward that 2023-2024 legislative session. Um, now, Mr. Chair, as I move forward, I do want to highlight one final component that does relate to this legislative session that just passed, and that is with regards to funding. Here it was a banner year for public transit in terms of the funding support that was provided by uh, the California legislature and Governor Newsom. Uh, Governor Newsom uh, did introduce, and there was some legislative back and forth between himself and legislative leaders on a transportation funding package. Ultimately, that transportation funding package was approved. And what's notable is that uh, roughly three and a half billion dollars was approved in new investment for the state's transit and inner city rail capital program. You'll see uh, under the second and third bullet point, the split between Southern California and other uh, areas of the state. A balance of those dollars are going to be going toward projects uh, that previously received awards from the TIRCP and that need additional dollars to either see themselves through completion or that can help them capture additional funds from the federal government uh, by way of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. But then there will be a balance of funds that will be provided for wholly new projects, bus and rail, that help transition us uh, to cleaner uh, modes of mobility uh, for the entire state. I do also want to note that there's this $4 billion, that fourth bullet point, uh, that is identified for fiscal years 23-24 and 24-25. That is money that the legislature has made a soft commitment to. The language 
uh, talked about the intent of the legislature to appropriate those dollars, but I wanna be clear, that does still require additional action to actually see uh, those dollars come online. And so one of the things that we certainly will be doing on Metro's behalf is advocating for those remaining dollars to be released because that does create some additional funding opportunities for Metro in those out years, uh, fiscal years 23, 24 and 24, 25. Now there's one more item that I wanna to touch on here and it relates to this transition to zero emission technologies. Here you will see that there was $3.53 billion that was invested in fiscal year 22, 23 for zero emission vehicles and charging and refueling infrastructure. We'll note that transit agencies in the state will be receiving uh, roughly $100 million uh, per year through fiscal year uh, 25, 26 has made a multi-year uh, appropriation with that investment to help uh, the transit vehicles move into zero emission technologies. Much of those dollars passing through usual programs uh, that agencies across the state are subscribing to, like the California Resources Board's hybrid and zero emission truck and bus voucher incentive project. But similarly uh, to my points around the TIRCP and those out year investments, the legislature made a soft commitment to also moving forward with $2.4 uh, billion uh, in fiscal years 23, 24 through 25, 26. And again, that is intent language. There needs to be some further action to actually see those monies come together. And so Mr. Chair, uh, that concludes my report and I'm happy to take any questions from the board. Michael, it's very informative information and I especially appreciate uh, all your work. It's been a busy year in the uh, transportation realm. And uh, that last information was very relevant to our transition to zero emission buses. Uh, I see Director Rotkin has a hand. Mike, take it away. I have, I have uh, just two quick comments. <clears throat> First of all, I'm just noting that of the money, the $3.53 billion that's uh, being, uh, it's getting soft, it still needs some follow-up, but that's you know, move, hopefully moving towards the, the public that only a hundred million of that's going to public transit, if I understand that correctly. And I think that's a political fight. I hope that our uh, legislative uh, advocates can be working on. Uh, I mean, how many presentations have we had from experts that the solution, you know, not that we're against having electric cars. I think they're a huge improvement, obviously, over uh, fossil fuel driven vehicles. But uh, the real solution here is public transit. And that's a pretty small percentage of the money that's going to fund the, what really should be the solution to a lot of these kind of climate change related issues. So that, that, that's a question about, I guess, our legislative program for the coming year, which we'll get to later, not at this meeting. Um, that, so that's one comment. And the other comment is really, I, I'm somebody who's a strong supporter of CEQA, uh, environmental reviews, and obviously supporting sales tax for public transit. But it's very refreshing to see that we're you know, actually seeing some reform in CEQA and uh, and in the sales tax exemption issue, uh, it, how many projects get tied up when it's clear that you know adding transit uh, in, in a community uh, really improves the situation environmentally? And you know, in the name of the environment, sometimes one or two people can totally tie up a huge project that would make a big difference in terms of uh, both the convenience to the public for public transit, but also you know, the issue of climate change and effect on our planet as a whole. So I'm, I'm very pleased to see that the legislature and the governor are sort of moving in the direction of these kinds of reforms that basically make it a lot quicker to get the, these uh, projects going and moving through and recognizing that they clearly have positive environmental impacts, although there may be things, to, you know, to be worked out. And there's no question about that. But some of these CEQA reviews have often tied things up. And even as somebody who supports CEQA, you, it's hard not to wince when you see some really good project that spends it's, it's an extra year in a process because they're going through a CEQA process that really is not necessary in terms of the, the logic of what's being built. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Director Austin, if, if I may, I do want to provide some additional context on that $3.5 billion and the investment in transit. I uh, will note that that $100 million is a uh, $100 million over the next three fiscal years, so $300 million total for the tr transit buses. What isn't spoken to there are also an additional $500 million that gets sub allocated by the California Resources Board. We don't present that as being scored for public transit because it's still subject to public discussion, but right. a balance of that will flow to public transit. Additionally, we'll highlight that while I highlighted the investments in public transit buses, as the state is also compelling transitions to zero emission rail 
zero emission ferry. There are additional dollars in that $3.5 billion that are dedicated towards that transition as well. Final note on that is that fully $1.5 billion of that 3.5 comes from Prop 98 dollars and are specific to school bus transition. School. Those dollars, because of the constitutional lockbox around those dollars, means that they can only be dedicated towards school purposes. And right. so uh, certainly I'll follow up with your, your staff and provide that fuller breakdown, uh, but there is continued progress in, in really amplifying uh, the needs of public transit in this space. Uh, and do know that we've had a uh, very warm reception from the California Resources Board and continue to make progress on this transition. Thanks for those clarifications. Very good. I appreciate both of those. Uh, Director Koenig, you're next. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Mr. Pimentel, for the for the update. It was really uh, exciting progress all around. Um, first, I just want to point out that um, while we are losing Assembly Member Stone, his district has been split into, into two districts, really. So we're we're actually expecting uh, you know, two new assembly members uh, that have an interest in Metro there. And then, um, you know, given the way the county is chopped up, there's actually could potentially be three uh, assembly members with a strong interest in uh, advocating for Metro. So um, that's potentially great news. I just want to make sure you're you're talking to all of those folks. Um, and then I did have a question for you on AB 2097 that's prohibiting a public agency from imposing parking minimums within half mile of public transit. I mean, that's this is fantastic, really groundbreaking. I mean, parking so often is a, a huge cost and impediment to building more units. Um, I'm just curious, is that is, is it what, what's the fine print there? Is a transit stop, you know, a, a major transit stop or a high frequency transit stop? I'm just wondering, um, you know, really how soon it would apply to some of the areas of the county. Yeah, sure thing. So the, the definition of the major transit stop, and here I'm actually on, on the slide before uh, the bill that you were speaking to, but it is defined as a site containing an existing rail transit station, a ferry terminal served by either a bus or rail transit service, or the intersection of two or more major bus routes with a frequency of service of 15 minutes or less, during the morning and afternoon peak commute period. And so we'll follow up with your staff uh, so that they have uh, clear insights into how this might apply to the Metro service territory, uh, but would agree you know, fully with just the groundbreaking nature of this uh, legislation and the ability for it to actually encourage uh, more folks to hop on public transit. Uh, and then finally, we'll acknowledge uh, that certainly as the Metro delegation expands uh, as part of our uh, ongoing conversations uh, with your CEO, we will be talking about uh, means of engagement uh, with uh, his, uh, with the expanded uh, delegation uh, that will be supported by us to make sure that you do have coverage and that they do have familiarity with Metro's priorities uh, for this upcoming session. Great, thank you. Very good. Good question, Manu. Uh, Director McPherson. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, on behalf of uh, Central Coast Community Energy, we have a carve out for grants for zero emission vehicles and public transportation. I know we've been working very closely with Metro. Uh, our Triple C has been working very close with Metro. And uh, I hope that, that maybe if the matching grant opportunity will give us uh, a more opportunity to uh, have more of our buses become electric in the near future. I, I know we have a great re working relationship, uh, Triple C does with Metro. So uh, I, I really look forward to us and I think this is good news and how this is for, uh, moving ahead. Um, I hope I hope more for public transit can be uh, allocated by the state. And um, I know that Triple C is interested in seeing how they, they, that can be expanded. Thank you. Thank you. Great comment, Bruce. Any other directors with uh, questions or comments on this? I'm looking to our attendees in the public. Um, if anyone from the public would like to ask a question, comment, uh, raise your hand, give you a few seconds. I think not. So let's move on to our next item. Uh, Wanda Moo, I think. Director Koenig uh, still has his hand up. Did he have additional? Nothing okay. else, thanks. I think Director okay. Rotkin's hand is still up too, but. Okay. Yeah, that's sorry. I'll let me take it down. Sorry. It's in the sun. It <laughs> looks kind of the same. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go to the next item. Wanda Moo, would you like to do the intro, please? And Michael, thanks again. That was great. 
Yeah, th and thanks for your, your service for us. I mean, this yes. is the small amount of money we spend for this legislative representation makes a huge, brings in way more money to us and, and uh, is a real service to our district and the public in Santa Cruz County. Thanks for your work. Very useful uh, for thank our you, director. Yes. Great, thank you. Thank you for providing that. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we also have uh, uh, Chris Guido uh, from uh, uh, Capital Age Team. Uh, Chris, Chris is a legislative advocate, our legislative advocate at the federal level. And so uh, Chris is going to provide us uh, the legislative update as to Metro today. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thanks, Wandamu. Uh, thanks, Chair Pegler. Uh, good to see everybody um, <clears throat> out there. Uh, I will say that, uh, that Michael and Wandamu recently shared with me, uh, you know, your uh, recent work with regard to strategic planning and kind of goals that are coming up. And, and I may be biased, but they sound really exciting to me. Uh, just exactly, this is exactly what, you know, Santa Cruz Metro does. They lead, uh, they punch above their weight. Uh, and it's, and it's really, it's really great, uh, great things. I, I'll also add that, um, that the CEO and Wandamu uh, in August uh, kind of previewed a little bit of this with our congressional delegation, with FTA. They made a really, really strong case for, um, you know, for assistance uh, for with all of these things. And uh, and I and I'm I would not be lying to say that uh, when Michael, uh, whenever Michael mentioned sort of housing and uh, the connections with transit, uh, everybody's eyes really lit up uh, <laughs> from Congressman Panetta. To the federal transit administrator, to uh, everybody, so um, so it's 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 a, it's really uh, it's really very exciting, um, and looking forward to to helping all with all I can with with regard to all of this. Uh, I did have a couple of slides that I will uh, try to share here. If I uh, I told Donna, I wasn't quite sure if I'd be good at this, but. Um, and so far, uh, <laughs> a couple, just a few things that I wanted to mention since we last spoke. Uh, first, uh, the uh, what, what is being called the Inflation Reduction Act was uh, sort of surprisingly uh, approved by Congress uh, in late July, early August. Uh, of course, the uh, the federal fiscal year twenty three budget. Uh, for the Department of, of Transportation. And of course, uh, uh, I think you guys are all aware we've got some elections coming up uh, pretty soon. So I thought I might do a little bit of a, a preview of what we uh, what we expect there. So I won't go into all of these bullets, but the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, I, I like to call a distant cousin of the president's Build Back Better uh, uh, program, his sort of soft infrastructure proposal. Uh, it was uh, a, a, a sort of a, a very robust $3.5 trillion Build Back Better plan was approved by the House last November, uh, right after the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law was passed. Uh, the Senate never took it up because they couldn't get 50 votes uh, to approve it. Uh, and a couple of uh, a couple of uh, senator Democratic senators were were not uh, excited about the the spending in this plan. So we thought for the most part in 2022 that this thing was dead. Uh, and all of a sudden in late July, uh, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and one of the kind of recalcitrant Democrats, Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia, <laughs> kind of popped up and said, hey, we've got this thing called the Inflation Reduction Act. It's got some decent things in it. Let's uh, let's vote on it. <clears throat> And it passed with uh, with fewer, actually in the Senate, there were no Republican votes for it. I think there were a few in the House. Um, and the president signed it into law. In many ways, as you can see from these uh, bullet points, it's it's very much sort of a, a tax bill and, uh, and, uh, and a health care bill uh, in many ways. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how it's going to reduce inflation, uh, but uh, IRA is a great uh, acronym, and so uh, they're they're sticking to it. Uh, as far as things that we would care about, the, there are a few highlights in there. Uh, unfortunately, one of the things that's not in there, and especially would be especially pertinent to sort of your new plans uh, with regard to housing, the original Build Back Better proposal that the president had and that the House approved last November had a $10 billion program. It was going to be a joint uh, Federal Transit Administration HUD program to make connections for housing and public transit, $2 billion a year over five years. Very exciting, kind of unfortunately got left on the cutting room floor. However, a few things were included in this final IRA, and one is the $3.2 billion for what they're calling the Neighborhood Access and Equity Grant Program. Uh, there is an existing program from the 2021 infrastructure bill called Reconnecting Communities, 
uh, and it's a and it's a it's a program to kind of address transportation facilities, for lack of a better word, roads and things that have split communities, and uh, um, and it's a big part of the president's uh, efforts to uh, address equity issues uh, through Department of Transportation grants. He only got about a billion dollars for this in the original infrastructure bill, but was able to kind of get another $3.2 billion uh, in it in this IRA. Uh, and so those are grants that I think, you know, uh, for the most part, it, it's talking about kind of roads and bridges and things like that. But transit agencies are certainly um, uh, uh, eligible for these grants and, and potentially there's something in there that uh, maybe a regional uh, um, approach might work. Uh, EPA's got about a billion dollars for uh, replacing heavy duty uh, diesel vehicles mostly um, with zero emissions ones. So we'll see that's going to be a new program. So they'll have to develop rules and regulations for that. Uh, and the other is uh, with regard to the tax stuff, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, tax credits for clean energy production. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, mostly sort of commercial entities would be able to take advantage of that. But there are a couple that that might be of interest in that they provide, uh, as opposed to, you know, Santa Cruz Metro not filing taxes, but uh, as we do with the alternative fuels tax credit currently, uh, these, they call them direct pay tax credits where we could apply uh, for a rebate. And one of those, uh, you may be familiar with the the zero emissions uh, commercial vehicle purchase. Uh, this was something that Congressman Panetta first introduced a couple of years ago on behalf of Santa Cruz Metro when we kind of explained to him that there was a pretty big delta between the cost of a CNG or a diesel bus and an electric bus. And in his position on the tax writing committee, Ways and Means, he uh, came up with this. Unfortunately, uh, it got shaved down to uh, uh, to capping that uh, rebate to forty thousand dollars per vehicle, uh, uh, Congressman Panetta's original legislation had no cap on that, uh, and it was going to be thirty percent. Uh, now it's thirty percent or forty k, whichever is is larger. And unfortunately, forty k would certainly be larger in the case of purchasing electric buses, and uh, and then things like uh, facility production for not only clean hydrogen, but other things like solar and, and other things. I, I mentioned hydrogen here because that's a, a potential uh, alternative to electric buses, right, is that is that hydrogen that we uh, may be looking at. So there's some there are some highlights for transportation in there. Transportation wasn't a heavy uh, focus on uh, in this bill because of the bipartisan infrastructure law. A lot of people felt like transportation got theirs, but but there were some uh, there were some good things in there with regard to um, us hopefully taking advantage. The fiscal year Department of Transportation budget fiscal year uh, 2023 started officially on October one, but as has been the case for the past 25 years, Congress has not been able to finalize a federal budget before that October one date. Uh, it's been 25 years since all, you know, the entire budget has been approved by Congress and signed into law by, um, by the president before that October 1 deadline. So um, not a great uh, milestone, but uh, um, here we are. So we're right now we're op uh, we're operating. Uh, the government is staying open under what they call a continuing resolution that Congress passed in uh, August. Uh, in anticipation of not meeting that October 1 deadline. And it kind of keeps programs funded at, at their current levels, essentially, uh, through December 16th. So it kind of gives them time to, uh, they've, they've been off for the whole month of October campaigning, uh, uh, Congress has, and uh, they're expected to kind of come back in mid-November in this post-election lame duck session, which they hope to finalize a budget uh, with regard to that. There is the potential that we could see this, what they call a year-long continuing continuing resolution or CR or stopgap funding uh, measure, which would kind of freeze everything at FY22 uh, levels. That wouldn't be terrible for us. It would have been terrible for us last year uh, because that uh, infrastructure bill, you know, really kind of increased uh, federal uh, transit administration formula programs uh, for that first year for FY22 from 21 to 22, there was a big jump. Uh, and so a full year CR last year would have been pretty, uh, pretty harmful to us. This year, not as bad uh, if they were to do that. I hope they won't uh, end up doing it. But those FY22 levels are, are much more robust than 21. And the expected increase from 22 to 23 was certainly not as much as, as that jump we, we received from 21 to 22. Uh, both the House and the Senate in their proposals for the 23 budget, which haven't been you know, enacted yet, both include what they call in the goofy uh, 
federal budget parlance as plus ups. There's, you know, there's guaranteed money for these uh, low and no emissions uh, bus and bus facilities grant programs, uh, con you know, that are baked in to law. They're guaranteed over the next five years from that 2021 infrastructure bill. Uh, but Congress has provided a little bit more money. So there's about one and a half billion dollars total for those two programs, competitive programs. Both the House and the Senate have, uh, have uh, wanted to uh, increase those by about $200 million in sort of additional uh, general fund money for that. So that's uh, that's always a good thing. Uh, and as always, I, I like to mention that, you know, the DOT programs are not necessarily contentious. These are not why the budget's being held up. Uh, it's more about sort of overall spending levels, uh, the way that um, that uh, the, the budget is split between defense and non-defense uh, spending uh, tends to be a, a problem between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, that's more of the issue, and, uh, and uh, but unfortunately, everything else kind of gets stuck uh, in there, and so we are in this sort of stopgap funding uh, uh, limbo right now. Last one I'll say is we, you know, uh, just like uh, Michael was mentioning, uh, there are federal elections too coming uh, uh, in about a little over a week. And uh, as is the case every two years, all 435 House seats are up in November. Uh, in this evenly divided chamber, Republicans just need a net game of uh, about five seats uh, to, uh, to get that majority. Uh, the Senate, 35 seats, Senate seats are contested. They uh, are up for re-election every six years, and they're kind of staggered. Uh, and uh, right now, the, the Senate, as you know, is, is divided evenly 50-50. Uh, the vice president uh, right now breaks ties, and so Democrats are technically in the majority. Uh, so Republicans would need just one net gain of a seat to, uh, to gain the majority there. Uh, and then probably, as you also know, the, uh, the California redistricting, just like in the state, uh, did affect the uh, the Santa Cruz County federal delegation. And so um, the, uh, uh, the what would be the new 19th district, uh, which Congressman Panetta is running in right now, will incorporate uh, areas that uh, are currently in, uh, in Anna Eshoo's district, uh, uh, the old 19th or the current 19th, the uh, Scotts Valley, San Lorenzo Valley, things like that. Uh, and then there's the new 18th district, which, you know, currently is represented most uh, by uh, uh, the city of Watsonville and other areas around there represented by Congressman Panetta would move into a um, uh, would move into a new this new 18th district that uh, right now uh, Representative Zoe Lofgren would be the incumbent uh, and would be representing Watsonville should she uh, should she be reelected. Uh, just a small note about, you know, hey, what happens, what's going to happen to all of this uh, if uh, Republicans are to, to take charge of one or uh, more of these uh, chambers? I would say we will see a lot of legislation, a lot of proposals to, um, uh, to reduce the deficit uh, and to to pair back lots of things like the Affordable Care Act. That's something Republicans have liked to do in the past. Um, maybe even try to claw back or, uh, or take back some of this money from the pandemic relief bills that we've had. Uh, that's unspent, or possibly from the uh, you know from the uh, infra 2021 infrastructure bill, which was a five-year uh, bill. Uh, I don't think that they'll at least for the next two years. While we have a a, a president who supports those things, I, I think he would veto anything that would reach his desk. Uh, and I think that the the division in both the House and the Senate would be so small that overturning a presidential veto would be difficult. You need two thirds to do that. So, uh, but I think that you know. Again, I, I I will say that uh, if Republicans were to uh, were to take charge in either one, we would probably be doing a lot of uh, defense with regard to uh, with regard to the spending that's been um, approved in the last couple of years, including that IRA that I spoke about, the bipartisan infrastructure law, and again, um, things like uh, the Affordable Care Act might be uh, things that that uh, Democrats at least uh, are going to, and the president are going to try to protect. So. Uh, that was all I had, uh, but uh, happy to answer any questions. And again, thanks uh, thanks again for your time. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Bruce, I see your hand. Yeah, uh, first of all, Chris, it was great to see you at the Pajaro uh, Levy uh, event. Uh, yes. uh, everybody that was important in politics, state and federal, was there. Uh, but nice to see you, but thank you for your work in Washington, D.C. Um, I just want to say that um, even though um, our incumbent um, Congresswoman from uh, the San Lorenzo Valley and northern Santa Cruz County 
Uh, Anna Eshoo is not going to be representing Santa Cruz County now. Jimmy Panetta will have it all, and that's an excellent representation. But just want to let you know that Anna Eshoo said, I've not forgotten Santa Cruz County and the North County of Santa Cruz County. Uh, we have two tremendous advocates there, and uh, just want to assure everybody Anna Eshoo will be on our side, even though she's not representing Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Thanks, Director. Supervisor. Yeah, absolutely. She, uh, she's been a great uh, advocate for Metro. Uh, and I think, uh, um, and, and also, uh, you, you mentioned the, the Levy event. It was, you know, Congressman Panetta, I, I think those of you heard him say that, you know, while uh, Zoe Lofgren might, you know, be the next uh, Congresswoman from Watsonville, consider it yourselves to have two members of Congress, I'm not going anywhere. So, uh, so yeah, I think we've, we've got a nice strong delegation that, uh, that cares a lot about this region. Thank you. Uh, Mike. Uh, first of all, thanks, Chris, for your work for us. Uh, same kinds of comments I was making about our state representation. This is really valuable for us as a district. Um, I had a question. And of course, nobody, I don't think anybody really knows what's going to happen in these midterms. It's scary on some level. Um, but you pointed out that if, even if there's, a, it's unlikely there would be a, a majority of Republicans sufficient to overturn a presidential veto for the next two years. But for at least for, I haven't heard about it recently, but about a month ago or two weeks ago, there was lots of discussion about Republican desires to perhaps um, not pass a continuing resolution, bring government to its knees. And I'm wondering, uh, again, it's a, it's a difficult prognostication, but what's your assessment of the likelihood that there could be a majority in, in the two houses? I mean, I don't think actually one house could stop it in, in, in either of the houses that stop a continuing resolution, which the re presidential veto doesn't help you with. You need to have a resolution that actually is offered to the president to sign to, to, a, to make it the thing move forward. You know, are we likely to see that happening? I mean, it'll be, I'm sure it'll, somebody will rattle that saber, but yeah. is, that, is that a likely prospect for us? Uh, I don't know if it's a likely prospect, but I think you're right. I think there'll be a lot, a lot of saber rattling. Uh, I, I think that there are a lot of uh, members of Congress, particularly those on the Republican side, who wouldn't mind a government shutdown. Uh, uh, I think that that's you know sort of all part of the process of hey, uh, hey, look, we survived. There was a government shutdown for for a week, and and everybody survived. And so this is a great case for smaller government. Uh, so that that is that is something that people think about. I, I don't think I think the majority of Republicans do want to, you know, have that budget passed. What they might want to do is, however, if they do take control of 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 one or other uh, one of one or both of the uh, the houses chambers, they might want to extend that continuing resolution into calendar year 23 when they have more impact on on the finalizing that of that budget. Uh, and so so we could potentially see that CR be extended into into calendar year 23. And then, you know, again, again you know, on the other hand, does a new member really want to, you know, continue to to fiddle with a budget that should have been passed several months ago? You know, they might just say, yeah, let's just do this CR and uh, and get it over with and, and we'll deal with the FY24 budget. So I, I think, you know, probably the chances of either of those happening are, are, are pretty good. <laughs> so. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for your sure. service again. Appreciate sure. it. Thank you. Next, I see Chevra, your hand. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, um, actually, Michael, I can uh, sort of ask my question, um, so I won't repeat it, but, but you don't have a sense, like, are there national polls that are um, indicating in either direction? Yeah, I think most of the I think most of the polls are showing that uh, that the House is going to flip uh, into Republican uh, into Republican areas. Uh, it's it's interesting. I have a I have a buddy who's a pollster, and um, and he and I'm sorry if I'm delaying your uh, extending your meeting, but it was interesting to me. He said that uh, that a lot, a lot of times with these federal you know uh, sort of polling is that the the uh, what you see in the polls in the beginning of the summer is usually what holds in November and a lot of stuff happens in between, but it usually sort of, and so, and that would say, you know, a Republican flip, he said, however, there is one thing, uh, there is one thing that, that happens every once in a while, we get this anomaly that, you know, kind of, um, that kind of moves the needle. Uh, and that, uh, that Roe v. Wade decision right. uh, potentially is going to be that. 
um, you know, that anomaly. So, uh, uh, but I think that, again, most of the polls are sort of showing that, uh, you know, it's sort of between, you know, the redistricting that happened in all these state legislatures, uh, uh, that that sort of has helped Republicans as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I was wondering how Roe v. Wade would play into it, but maybe not. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for the work. Thank you. Uh, Director Parker. Thank you. Hey, I just wanted to reiterate, um, uh, just like a, a supervisor, um, uh, I'm sorry, my brain just went. But anyway, I just want to reiterate the fact that Zoe Lofgren has been a great friend to Watsonville so far, and I hope that she continues to be a friend uh, to Metro uh, with our infrastructure, as well as uh, all the um, issues that we have with our South County. And, and uh, Chris, I'm glad you said that about uh, Jimmy. Jimmy said he's right outside our city limits. <laughs> so we uh, we at first were kind of shocked and horrified. We weren't going to have uh, Jimmy Panetta. <laughs> but now we've embraced the fact that we have two Congress people working for the Paro Valley and, uh, and all the infrastructure that goes in there. So um, we're pretty happy about it now. Good point. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I think uh, I think that um, uh, Congresswoman Lofgren has a great reputation as a hard worker and uh, and a compassionate uh, uh, member of Congress, and I, I I can't imagine that she's not going to be uh, helpful to Metro, and we're going to make sure she is. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Chris. Uh, all good stuff. I appreciate your taking the time to tell us what's going on in D.C. Your perspective is most appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Uh, next item, I believe. Um, I'm looking to the public just to see if there are any hands. I haven't seen any come up. All right. Next item, uh, Michael Tree, you're going to talk about social equity and community funding policy. Yeah. Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, it's good to be here. And, um, you know, maybe just to set the stage on this policy that we brought to you today for your consideration. Um, at the recent workshop, we talked about the uh, one right at a time program that we were putting together. And this is a pretty collaborative program where we're working with the Regional Transportation Commission. They have a TDM program, uh, which is really a customer rewards program. So, you know, at the onset, we, we recognize that purely by riding the bus, you're, you're, you're doing more than your share to, uh, you know, preserve the environment just by riding uh, and, uh, and enjoying the bus system. But we wanted to go a step further and allow the opportunity for our riders to, uh, to basically make uh, financial contributions to the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And so in partnering with RTC and their customer rewards program, if you take a certain number of rides, there's a scale, uh, but if you, as you take rides, you're able to assign uh, dollars uh, to a nonprofit of your choice. And so having an option for them to assign their dollars that they've earned from riding the bus to the, uh, to the sanctuary, uh, we think is a, is a great partnership. And I think we showed you at the workshop uh, how we were going to take a certain percentage of the buses and, with our partners, uh, dress them up, so to speak, with uh, wildlife from the sanctuary, uh, which would be really stunning. So in working with uh, Julie Sherman, your, your legal counsel, we began asking the question, what can uh, contractors and those who are coming to work uh, who are consultants uh, for Metro, what can, how can we help them uh, with our key mission of preserving and improving the environment, uh, much like we're helping the riders through RTC's uh, customer loyalty program. So with that said, uh, Julie really worked with a team of, uh, of uh, legal counsel there at Hanson and Bridget, and we've come back uh, and want to present to you uh, really a policy that allows them to do that, to, to have our suppliers and our uh, consultants that are coming on board at Metro be a part of uh, even furthering our mission statement. So with that, I'll let uh, Julie walk you through the policy and talk about it for a few minutes, uh, but I'm pretty excited. This is uh, kind of groundbreaking, I think, in public transit, and I, I think we can have a big impact with it. 
Thanks, Michael, and good morning, everybody. Um, so yeah, as Michael said, we've been working on this policy and it basically is a procurement policy and it has a couple of different aspects. The first aspect is the community funding policy that Michael talked about and you learned a little bit about at the retreat. And because we're talking about using public funds, we have to have you know a bunch of reminders in the policy about you know tying those funds to support Metro's purposes um, because we don't want to run afoul of the gift of public funds prohibition. And so that first piece is for best value procurements. And the reason it's best value is that Metro has the ability to use best value procurements for certain things. So you can't use this policy in a construction contract, for example, where you have to award by law to the lowest bidder. But you have the ability under your enabler. Most responsible bidder. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Mike. <laughs> yeah, that's important. Um, but you have the ability under your enabling legislation, because we actually amended your enabling legislation a couple of years ago, or it could be more and time flies, um, to use a best value process when you're awarding contracts for certain types of contracts. And in the best value process, you get to, to make up your own criteria that are in your best interest. And so typically, you you know, you do consider price, you always consider price, um, but you would have experience, qualifications, references, key personnel, those are kind of the standard things. But agencies are now starting to say, you know, what else can we do to encourage our contractors to be, you know, partners with us and good corporate citizens in our communities? And so agencies have started to look at awarding points in best value procurements for things like a community funding policy um, and a corporate social equity policy. Um, so so that's that the first piece is that community funding, and it would work like just like this. We have a community funding policy. We're supporting partners in our community that intersect with our you know, Metro's, you know, mission and purpose. And if you give us a discount in your pricing, we're going to take that discount and we're going to give it to our community partners. And it's also going to be um, an advertising promotion at the same time, like you saw at the retreat. And it's an optional program. We're not saying you have to do this. You know, if you don't want to do it, you don't do it and you give up those points and you would focus your proposal on you know, points that you really wanted to go after. And that's no different than any best value procurement where there's points and you go after what you feel you can go after. Um, and then the second piece is the corporate social equity piece. And that encourages companies again with points that they can be awarded to show us what kind of company are you? You know, are you hiring in our community? Are you, um, do you have, you know, fair pay practices? Are you using sustainable products and sustainable, you know, supply chains? And it's it's gonna take some, you know, time for staff to think about, you know, which procurements it makes sense to do these. Do you do one or both? And And what are the key things that you're trying to achieve in terms of, you know, the social social equity piece. So that's basically how it works. And I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody wants to look specifically at any aspects of the policy. Thank you, Julie. Any questions for? I guess the one I would ask is just, are there other jurisdictions or uh, public agencies that are examples of this and have had it in place for a while? So the short answer is, well, for my clients, I do have some that are very close to adopting a policy like this, but they haven't done it yet. Uh -huh. there, there are definitely agencies out there that do have social equity policies. Um, they're, they're not my clients, they're not transit districts. Got it. So you, you're on the cutting edge 
others have done it, um, but it, legally you're totally fine. And it's just sort of a matter of seeing how it's gonna work in practice. Thank you, that's helpful. Any other comments, questions from, oh, I see one from the public, just a moment. Uh, Brandon Frazier, Brandon Frazier, Brandon Freeman. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon, take it away. There you right go. Now. All right, there we go. Okay. I just wanted to jump in real quick and say that um, I did have a couple of questions on this item and Michael met with me yesterday and kind of explained to me what the vision was for this type of thing. Um, in my time here over the last 10 years, we've kind of been a little isolationist almost with Metro and as far as the involvement with the rest of the city, the county, things like this. So I really think that this type of thing is a, is a really good step forward for us to try to move forward into becoming more of a uh, complete picture type of local government rather than metro and something else. This is really a way for us to reach out and start getting into some of these environmental programs um, and really start showing the community that we're stepping up into more things than just getting a bus on the road. So um, just want to jump in and let you guys know that as far as we're concerned over here at SMART, um, you know, we, we're on the same page with Michael on this one. Thank you, Brandon. That's helpful. Any other comments from folks, neither public or on the board? I see one from the board. Oh, Michael, take it away. Tell us more. You know, I, I just wanted to mention that, you know, as we move along and apply this policy, if it's the board's direction to, to move forward, you know, we'll, we'll bring back how it does uh, get applied in the procurement process. And uh, I think that'll be important because uh, it'll be kind of a a living policy, so to speak, as the board moves along that they can tweak as they see fit. But uh, I think reporting back to the board how it's implemented will be important. Very good. Uh, any other comments? Uh, Shepra. I just um, really appreciate Michael, you and staff bringing this forward and Brandon's comments just now. I think it is important that we see ourselves as more than moving people from one place to another, but that we're really um, part of a larger system and network of, um, of reaching climate response, um, being climate, climate responsible and, and being in action around climate response. So if there are other comments, I'm happy to make a, do we, we need to accept this, make a motion to move this forward? Yes. Yeah. There's motion. a motion. I'll second. A second. I'll, I'll second. There we go. Thank you, Mike. We have a motion from Chevrolet and a second from Mike. And with that, I see no other comment. Let's proceed with a vote. Okay. Director Brown? Aye. Director Downing? Aye. Director Dutra? Aye. Director Colin Terry Johnson? Aye. Director Koenig? Aye. Director Lynn? Aye. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Myers? Aye. Director Pegler? Aye. Director Parker? Aye. Director Rockin. Aye. And the motion passes. Very good. Thank you for your work on that. Julie, good, great stuff coming forward. And Michael, I, again, would like to echo Brandon's comments. I think this is a good approach and a great direction. Thanks for the step. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next on our item is the oral report from our CEO, Michael Tree. All right. Well, uh, tomorrow my daughter's getting married, and then next oh. week I have surgery. So I'm hopeful to give you somewhat of a, you know, understandable uh, executive director's <laughs> report. Um, but, you know, things are going well. Um, September, you know, I'll start with ridership. The, the staff really has the goal of getting that ridership up 100% over five years, uh, as we mentioned in the workshop, and that'll hit that 7 million ridership mark for a year. Uh, of ridership, which hasn't been done in about 20 years at the agency. So it's like the probably the top focus, I think, uh, in addition to the other two uh, goals that we have. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about it. Uh, September was a great month. I mean, uh, UCSC got into, into full motion. We had the fare free going for a couple of weeks to get people accustomed to the new schedule that had been introduced. Um, just real briefly, uh, total ridership was 91% of pre-COVID in September. So it just rocketed uh, up the charts, which was great to see. 
uh, UCSC ridership was 104% of pre-COVID, kind of comparing it to uh, September of 2018. And I know there were some, um, you know, to make that apples to apples, certainly uh, I think there were a few more days for the school year uh, in this particular session than back in 2018. But, you know, ridership's going in the right direction. It's about 71% of pre-COVID if you go back and take the last three months. Um, so uh, we're making progress. It's exciting. Uh, with paratransit, um, you are at pre-COVID ridership levels. In fact, September was 112% uh, of uh, ridership as compared to September of 2018, uh, that last uh, September before uh, COVID uh, came around. So we're excited. Um, we've got a couple of things coming up um, in regard to uh, pilot projects that I think we'll be talking to the board about before the end of the calendar year to further increase fixed route ridership. Um, new operators are key in, in keeping that ridership momentum. We've got nine in the current class. I think we've been reporting that for a, a month or so as they've been in classes. They actually went to the DMV this week to get their uh, license to be able to drive the buses on the public streets. And so we're we're excited, uh, number one, that they're in class and that things are going well there. But we're excited that none of them have dropped off. Uh, all nine have kind of come along during the class and now uh, are uh, with the DMV. So retention's going well with these classes. We've got uh, 15 in the incoming class. Uh, after interviewing some 50 uh, applications that came in in the latest recruitment cycle, we've got 15 narrowed down. And then we've got a new rec recruitment cycle that'll be happening in the new, near future. So you know, hats off to, to Margo and to Don uh, in their efforts to really increase the throughput of folks uh, coming into recruitment and then through the, uh, the training. Um, you know, in regard to uh, COVID, uh, you know, it's, uh, we've had three positives over the last month, but none of our departments are in what they consider that minor outbreak. Uh, uh, stage or status. And so things are moving along there and certainly manageable. Uh, a couple other things to, to cover. Uh, you know, we talked a lot about uh, zero emission buses and our goals uh, moving forward at the workshop. Uh, you know, we outlined, I think, at the workshop, 12 different funding sources that we had assembled uh, that Wanda Moo had worked on uh, to assemble funding for zero emission buses and, and near future purchases. And this week we're working really hard to assemble uh, the funding for infrastructure because that's the uh, missing ingredient for uh, basically ordering the buses and taking delivery of them. So uh, we've got a lot of discussions ongoing. I think we'll bring back information to you on November as to how that is shaping up. Um, and 3C Energy is playing a key role in those discussions. Um, I know Director McPherson had made a comment there, and it's great to have kind of a regional local agency helping us with those efforts. And I know uh, Guy Preston at RTC has also been actively involved in, in our mission there with Zeb. Um, finally, you know, in regard to um, Housing, you know, we talked about the housing goal. Uh, staff had a goal of 175 new housing units in the next decade on Metro property. Uh, we're continuing to move those concepts forward, but I, I would like to say that in the interim, we're, we're really working at ways that we can redevelop that Watsonville Transit Center. And so uh, happy to announce that we've got two new tenants that are either in or going to be in in the near future. We've got a Mexican uh, food uh, restaurant that'll be going in as well as a place where you can buy avocados of all things. So, but a nice mix and we're really working hard to see what we can do to make improvements to make that environment for folks that want to eat uh, uh, with that Mexican food restaurant and, and otherwise, you know, just give them a good ambiance, kind of like we've done at the Scotts Valley Transit Center to feel comfortable as they're uh, enjoying uh, their meal. Um, I probably, uh, you know, if you were looking at big challenges and what's uh, keeping us up at night, um, certain, the supply chains are continuing to be difficult to work with. Um, I think 
our maintenance department and our operators, uh, everyone's done a great job at managing the situation. But just to give you an example of our supply chain challenges, um, we've had an order in with uh, Ford for delivery of seven paratransit uh, vehicles, uh, cutaways, the, the vans uh, with the shells on them. That order has been in place since 2019, and this week they actually canceled that order. Uh, so we're looking into that and and what uh, you know what rights we have in the cancellation of that order, but um, it just gives you an idea of how difficult it is to get chips and parts for the manufacturers to actually be able to make the delivery of the vehicles. And then if you look on the fixed route side of things, uh, we've got a handful of buses <laughs> down awaiting chip uh, related parts for transmissions. So uh, thank goodness that we've got a pretty robust uh, fleet that uh, allows us to keep the buses, you know, on the road that we need to for the service levels that we've uh, promised the public. But uh, it's a real challenge behind the scenes. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Eddie and Margo and, and the great work that they've done uh, at maintenance to, uh, to keep uh, vehicles uh, moving while we're working through those challenges. And then last but not least, I think there's a couple of procurements that we'll be bringing to you before the end of the year, and it'd be good to put them on your radar. Uh, we'll be having a consultant uh, selected, and then your uh, consideration of a contract for our short and our long-range planning. And so that'll be key in uh, making sure that you reach your goals, your vision uh, for what you have for Metro moving forward. And especially uh, it, kind of, it relates to the concepts, uh, the principles that uh, you talked about at the workshop in regard to how public transit uh, functions and what you can do as policymakers to uh, make adjustments. And then we've also got a marketing uh, proposal, uh, proposals that we'll be receiving this week. And we're hopeful that by the end of the calendar year, you're looking at a marketing contract, uh, and that would include revising or uh, kind of renovating your website and a host of other uh, really prominent uh, writer interface tools that they use, uh, which will help uh, with the ease of using Metro. And then finally, as we mentioned at the workshop, uh, your automated passenger counting system, which is a fantastic tool for writers and for the agency. Uh, this week, we actually started installing those in the buses, and so you've got Isaac and uh, Brandon from SMART working to get those installations done and ready for the public usage, and uh, their goal is to have that project wrapped up uh, at the latest in February, but it looks promising that that could ha even happen earlier. So, so long story short, there's a lot going on at Metro, but I think we're pretty focused on ridership. We're focused on the zero emission bus program and uh, and we're focused on housing. So uh, there's a lot of good things to, to be talking about. Thank you, Michael. Congratulations on the wedding and best wishes for the surgery. Questions from uh, the directors? Uh, Dan Henderson. Hi there, thanks for the, uh, the summary, uh, Mike. Can you confirm who the firm is that you guys are utilizing for the uh, automatic passenger counting? Is that Clever Devices or am I mistaken? It is Clever Devices. Happy, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I'm looking to the public. Any hands there? I'm seeing none. So, um, gee, we're reaching the end of our meeting. Always interested in moving us along on a Friday. Uh, we'll announce that our next meeting is a little early. It will be on Friday, November 18th, thanks to the Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, it will be via teleconference once again. And with that, I believe we adjourn the meeting. Thank you all. Have a great weekend. I'll see you next month. Thanks, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Metro staff could stay on for a moment. And Shebra, I'm going to give you a call. And Donna, you'll let me know if I need to sign anything. <laughs> Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Okay. Okay, so do we want to just take like a 15-minute break here and come back to do the post board, or do you want to come back at 1 o'clock? Let's just do it now. You want to do now. it now? Okay. Yeah, like now. We don't, I don't need a break. Okay. All right. Break.
All right. It's only 1030. We're, we're good. I know. <laughs> hey, Donna, when was the uh, meeting with Ari and Jimmy? Uh, 11 o'clock. Okay, got it. So we stay okay. on here or are we going to move over? Yeah, why don't we just stay on here then? Everyone's here, so. Um, it, it's still recording. Yes, yeah. it's recording and you have 26 participants. Yeah, that's okay because um, I can't, if I cut.